It's uh, a really great honor to have Professor Jay Lund here from the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at UC Davis. And as we, many of us aspire to be, he truly is a very interdisciplinary person and he draws on all of the various disciplines in which he holds an expertise to solve and plan for solutions for big water problems. His PhD is in civil engineering from UW and his uh, Master's uh, of Arts is in Geography, also from University of Washington. He has a BA in Regional Planning and International Relations from University of Delaware, and he also has a BS in Civil Engineering from uh, University of Washington. He's the director for the Center for Watershed Science and, um, and also a Ray Crone Professor of Environmental Engineering at UC Davis. He has lots of different affiliations at Davis with geography, hydrologic science, international agriculture development graduate program. He works a lot with the UC Public Policy Institute. And we were just talking this morning on the way over about his relief in having delivered with a large group of collaborators across a variety of different disciplines, policy, uh, ecology, water resources, this enormous Bay Delta report on how to manage water resources in the Bay Delta moving forward. Um, I got a lot of perspectives about Jay when I was asking uh, friends of his, you know, tell me about this person. He's a very special, very well-known person. Tell me about him. He's exceptionally sophisticated perspective on natural resources and their role in society. I'm told he's a remarkably interdisciplinary academic career, and it spans all of these different disciplines that I just described. Um, in his early career, water resources planning for hydropower and water supply is really what he was focusing on. And uh, most of his career has been engaged with water resources. He has a significant international experience in Latin America and Europe. But really, uh, we're excited to hear about what he's going to tell us uh, today about ground, groundwater in California because he's regarded as one of the really few truly influential leaders on the debate about how the future of California's water resources might be rationally managed. So we're really happy to learn from you about California's water today, Jay. And we get to have him here because he has won this honor of being the David Keith Todd Distinguished Lecturer for the California Groundwater Resources Association. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think from that introduction, you, you've probably learned a couple of things. One. Probably the most important thing you learn is I have, had, I have a very short attention span. <laughs> That's, I think, a, a, the essence of being in multidisciplinary is you have to have a short attention span. Um, again, I want to thank the, uh, the ground, California Groundwater Resources Association for sponsoring this lectureship. And there's uh, three um, consulting firms, uh, Regenesis, uh, Geosystech, and Ludolf and Scalmanini that sponsor these. Uh, they're in honor of, uh, of course, David Keith Todd, a very famous Professor at Berkeley, that school down the river from us um, at UC Davis. Uh, the title of what I want to talk about today is um, Can We Stop Undermining Our Groundwater Supply, Our Water Supplies, Our Groundwater, and California's Water Future? There's a lot of uh, silos in thinking about water management in general and certainly in California. Every agency has its own perspective, its own specialty. Every scholar has his own, his or her own perspective and, and, and view of things. But we live in a water system, particularly in California, where everything is really works together or has to work together if it's going to work well. And, and so my the theme here is how can we try to work groundwater more in a more integrated way into the overall water management in the state. Um, some of the She's already said some nasty things about me. Here's a place to find some more. Uh, this is the Watershed Center for UC Davis, uh, where I spend most of my time. This is my hobby. Um, and this is my faculty website. And then we have a, a, a fun uh, California water blog. Um, we have April Fool's versions that, I, that uh, have become popular in, in some circles. Um, uh, again, thanks to a whole bunch of people, uh, certainly the GRA and the, and the firms that are supporting this uh, this set of talks. Uh, I'd like to thank my former students. Uh, the students usually don't realize how much professors learn from you. Uh, so I'd like to make that explicit here um, because I don't really consider myself as much of a groundwater expert as I consider those students to be groundwater experts. Um, 
some colleagues at UC Davis, Thomas Harder and Graham Fogg, uh, former professor Steve Burgess, who a few of you might know. Uh, they all taught me a lot about groundwater, but I'm still making mistakes and there's still a lot I don't know. <coughs> An alternative title for this, it, since I don't really consider myself a groundwater expert, um, I'm just a sort of tension span systems engineer that happens to wander into groundwater problems. Um, maybe another title would be the groundwater confessions of a surface water management modeler. Really how, how groundwater fits into water management in California. Uh, as an outline for what I'd like to talk about today, I want to talk a little about how uh, groundwater does fit in California's water management. Talk some of the, about some of the major groundwater problems we have in California. Uh, the local groundwater management successes we have in California because groundwater management is overwhelmingly local. We often talk about state management and federal roles, but the, like, as with most of water, the overwhelming majority of water management decisions are made by local water users and local water districts. Something like 90% of the money spent on water problems in the state of California is spent at the local level. Look a little bit at the state roles in groundwater management uh, because that is also important and it's something that unites all of the local problems. Uh, some of the likely changes in groundwater problems, again, here I am speaking to a university audience. You students, you're gonna, your careers are going to be the problems of the future, not the problems that I learned about when I was a graduate student. A lot of those are going to be solved or gone or changed into your careers. So again, I'm trying to prognosticate out a little bit into how these problems are likely going to be changed into the future. And then the theme, back to the theme of integrating groundwater into water management overall, trying to improve the state's role in this, some conclusions. And then of course, because I'm a professor, I'll give you some further reading. A little bit of context on water management in California. This map on the left, shows where the water comes from, the fresh water comes from. Oops. These very dark blue areas are the 20% of the surface area of the state of California that produces two-thirds of the water. That's the water that recharges the aquifers and water that runs off streams. Light blue area, another 24% of the available water, 20% of the surface area. This dark red area is 30% of the surface area of California, produces 0.1% of the runoff. That's where, where the water is. Oh, and I have to also mention, this is a Mediterranean climate. I came here, I moved to California from the East Coast. This is a very, I, have, I experienced abrupt climate change. Some of you may have as well. This water is available in the, in the winter, and the snow melt is in the spring, and very little of it is available in the summer. Here's where we ask for water. The big urban areas and the agri big agricultural areas. And some ideas for the agricultural areas of how much that water is worth uh, per acre foot. Where is the water relative to where we want it? Where we want it is where the water ain't both in space and in time. As a water engineer, this is heaven. Many of you will be employed because of this mismatch. It's terrible, but it has its benefits. So what we've done is we've built a whole bunch of infrastructure. So this is the normal way we look at the infrastructure of California water. All these arrows are different aqueducts, except for these few blue arrows, those are rivers. But if you ever go look, at, go look at the Sacramento River, you'll see it actually looks more like an aqueduct. It's riprapped, it's levied, it's not really a natural river anymore. We have all these reservoirs, these triangles, right? And the hy hydropower plants, the little blue dots. That's how we normally look at this infrastructure. But I thought, you know, I'm giving a groundwater talk. So if I was coming in from Mars, this is how I would see California's water system, from the top down. If I were coming up from the center of the Earth, like a true groundwater person, this is how I'd see it. I'd see the aquifers first. And you'd say, wow, look at all that water. 
that I'm coming up into. And look at that huge amount of storage that I'm coming up into. Before you'd see these little pipelines and these little reservoirs on the surface. So I, I want you to think about how these things come together. And, and so I, actually one thing I really like about these talks is it's forced me to look at it from the bottom up rather than the top down. A little bit about groundwater's role in this, in this uh, really interesting infrastructure and environmental system. What, ground, what does groundwater do? It collects water from precipitation, from streams, from reuse. Water that I apply to crops, some of which percolates. It stores water. It stores water from that wet season to the dry season. It stores it from wet years to dry years. And it's stored in a mining kind of a way, just like there are deposits of oil that are storing oil until we decide we want to make use of it. And you can see examples of all these kinds of storage in California. It conveys water. So the aquifers allow water that's collected in different parts of an aquifer to come to a point where I have a well or a stream that's running through it. We also use groundwater to drain these systems. So if we have extra salts in the, in the soils, we'll drain that off into the groundwater quite often. The extra nit nitrogen that we apply to fields percolates down into the aquifers. Extra water that we apply to keep the, the root zones from waterlogging, it drains off. So we use groundwater as a drain. And something that I hadn't realized you know, as an engineer, I hadn't realized until a, a decade or so ago, is that the groundwater table is actually a form of support for a lot of riparian and wetland ecosystems. And if you had a lower water table, those systems would drain and you wouldn't be able to support the kinds of vegetation that, that we rely on for those ecosystems. Here's a little bit of an attempt to try to quantify for the, for the economic uses, economic management of the system, the, the different kinds of capacities and, and uses we make of surface and groundwater storage in California. The total storage capacity on the surface water reservoirs is about 42 million acre feet. The total capacity of groundwater storage in California, depending upon how you calculate it, is between about 150 million acre feet and about 1.2, 1.1 billion acre feet. So again, this is puny surface water stuff in terms of storage. In terms of seasonal storage, th these come from model results. So, and every every season is a little different. So there, these are ranges here, but every season we we have seasonal storage of between five and eight million acre feet from the wet season to the dry season that comes out of surface water. So the reservoir is filling and emptying part way. And groundwater also provides a lot of seasonal storage. If you look at groundwater traces anywhere in the state, you'll see them get higher and get lower and get higher and lower. And that seasonal amplitude is about three to six million acre feet. In droughts, we have much more amplitude. So we're, we have six-year droughts often in California. Surface storage, we will draw down that 42 million acre foot down by about 15 to 18 million acre feet over a course of a six-year drought. We'll do about 20 to 25 million acre foot of drawdown in the aquifers. So for surf seasonal storage, we're a little bit more surface water dependent. In, in drought storage, we're a bit more groundwater dependent, particularly for the longer droughts. And in terms of water deliveries, where does your water come from? If you turn it onto the tap, you apply it to a field. 60 to 70 percent typically comes from surface water. 30 to 40 percent for, for groundwater with the 40 percent, the higher numbers for groundwater typically be, being from droughts. Major groundwater problems in California. Almost all groundwater problems are local. You, you experience them locally. Uh, and so different areas will have different priorities on these, but this was just some, some thoughts of mine. Um, the first problem I'll mention is undermining surface water. Before the development of pumps, the groundwater tables were at a high equilibrium level. When we started pumping water from groundwater, that water initially comes from reducing the water table levels, reducing storage in the aquifer, 
And then that lower level in the aquifer brings in more water from the streams, water flowing from high elevations to low elevations, right? So when we're pumping water, groundwater today, where does that water come from? In the Sacramento Valley, it all eventually has to come from surface water. So I like to tell people up there that almost all groundwater use is stolen surface water, stolen at some place or time. And there's very few exceptions to that, I think. Maybe some coastal aquifers might be a little different than that. So we've really fundamentally changed the surface and groundwater hydrology by several million acre feet in the Central Valley because of that lowering of the groundwater table. At least that's what the modeling results seem to suggest. We also have groundwater overdraft in a few areas of California. Not so many as you'd think in terms of popular discussions. Primarily, it's down in the Tulare Basin. And I'll have a slide on that. We have localized contamination, uh, primarily urban. So all these leaky sewer systems, uh, old TCE plumes, industrial plumes, gas station plumes, MTBE plumes, all these things that, that uh, we all know well and are classical contamination problems. We've largely figured out how to solve those. We're certainly in the past the first flush of figuring out these problems. Some larger problems that we have for groundwater are regional contamination problems in terms of salt plumes and nitrate plumes that go over millions of acres, hundreds of thousands or millions of acres. These are much more difficult to treat and can't be treated really economically in the classical way of localized contamination. Something which has become more prominent in the last decade or two, the loss of riparian and wetland ecosystems, again, coming from us undermining that surface water, and lowering groundwater tables in quite a few locations. We also have some really fun classical problems of land subsidence that have come from groundwater use. Uh, that I find it ironic that you've depleted groundwater, and really the problem of this is you now have a worse flood control problem, or your canal canals no longer flow like you thought because you've affected their gradient. And then we also have problems in terms of shortages of water and excesses of wastewater discharges um, in terms of how do we going to allocate the water availability and the right to discharge contaminants into that common drain we often call an aquifer. And again, all of these are really very localized in their experiences and local conditions, which will keep many of you well employed for quite a long time. So uh, a few slides on a few of these problems. Uh, groundwater overdraft. So this comes out of a really wonderful report by uh, Claudia Font et al., a USGS report in 2009 on the Central Valley aquifers in, Cal in California. And this shows the overdraft uh, from the 60s to roughly the present. Um, you can see that for the Sacramento, Delta, and San Joaquin basins, we're sort of roughly in balance. And the Tulare Basin is really where we, we have sustained long-term overdraft. So the overdraft in the system in California is mostly in the Tulare Basin. And that amounts to about 15% of the net water use in this very valuable uh, basin in terms of agricultural production. Tulare Basin uses more water than any other Hi, large hydrologic basin in the state, and it's the most in overdraft. Some additional overdraft uh, areas and smaller areas of the Central Valley, Antelope Valley, Pajaro Valley, Salinas Valley, a few other coastal aquifers. You, you all locally in Southern California can probably give, you some, give me some examples I'm not aware of. Uh, the lower water table that is, as I mentioned before, uh, this is a nice map from, from Fontenelle's uh, Wonderful report showing the, the general lowering of the water table uh, throughout the Central Valley, particularly in the Tulare Basin, but also up and down. This is a picture of an artesian well from, uh, this is San Bernardino back in the early days. Uh, do you see many artesian wells in California uh, anymore? Uh, they were very popular, particularly before pumping technology became available. <coughs> you know, imagine how many wells you're going to have and how deep the wells are going to be if you're going to have to dig them by hand and you're going to have to pull them up, pull up the water with buckets. Artesian wells were really quite a source of prosperity for a lot of local areas in the early days. So this lowering of the groundwater tables generally has caused losses of uh, flows in, in many of the streams, lost habitat, and of course some, quite a bit of subsidence. And so we're sort of seeing uh, some new institutions that 
have grown up in California that are sort of rare elsewhere of, of water replenishment districts where we're going to try to take surface water and actually try to replenish some of that groundwater. Uh, land subsidence, uh, this is probably the iconic picture of land subsidence probably in the world, certainly in California. Um, Poland's uh, work in the 1970s. Uh, this is the subsidence in the San Joaquin Valley. We still have some in the Antelope Valley today. Um, again, primarily down in the Tulare Basin, but we have little bits in the Sacramento, and then we have a lot of peat subsidence that's not groundwater related. Um, it's oxidation of, of the soils in the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta. Most of this, I think, is legacy subsidence. It happened in the past. We now have a lot of groundwater substitution, but we still have some continuing subsidence uh, near the San Joaquin River, and, uh, which is currently causing some flooding and, and canal problems. And I think, I, I think this Antelope Valley subsidence is also fairly recent. I'm not sure. The regional groundwater pro quality problems are, is what I've been working on most in the last couple of years, uh, particularly nitrate contamination. Um, these are, this is the Tulare Basin and the Salinas Basin just a bit north of here. Or, yeah, mostly north of here. Um, the green area, the red areas are, have a high nitrate loading, so more than 500 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year. A lot of these are dairies. The rate at which, application rate at which you would have a um, violate groundwater standards, drinking water standards, are about 30. So most of the green areas here, the yellow areas, the red areas, those are all areas that will eventually have groundwater which you cannot drink legally under state public health legislation, regulations. And this is a tremendous area. This is millions of acres of land. So if you're a small town, small individual household in these areas, if you don't have a drinking water problem now, you will, you will someday in the future. This problem takes decades to develop, and it take, even if you were to magically eliminate those sources today, you would have that contaminated plume moving down into your, towards your drinking water wells for decades to come. So it's, it's really a tremendous um, public health and, and economic problem for those areas. If you're, if you're managing a small water system, the costs of treatment and, uh, are really quite high. We have a similar problem in terms of salt accumulation, although there the cost is primarily in terms of uh, environmental implications and in terms of reduced agricultural productivity. Um, we might have maybe half a million acres of, of land in the San Joaquin Valley that's, that's affected by this. These are, again, regional, tremendously large groundwater problems. Uh, they're, not, they're not your urban plumes, these little urban plumes that we spend a lot of money and time and, and scholarship on. These are primarily originating from agriculture. 95, 98% of the excess nitrogen in these basins is coming from agricultural fertilizers and manures. Um, the salts are overwhelmingly coming from agricultural water uses. They have a, there's a tremendous role for the state regulatory policy in this. These are both also problems where the economic costs of the contamination are probably much less, probably much less than the cost of source control. It's very expensive in terms of crop yields to get the surface applications of nitrogen to be lower than the drinking water standards. Huge cost of source control. To a large degree, I think, for these regional contamination problems, we're into, into, into an area of how do we optimally manage degradation. So in terms of state law, we're not allowed to degrade aquifers. But in terms of the economics and social interests in this system, it, I think there's a good argument to be made that if you were to, to clean up those aquifers by source control, you'd be eliminating the economic base of, this, of the uh, houses and the communities that are relying on that aquifer for groundwater, for drinking water. So they, people would move away if you got rid of the source. It's really a dilemma. This is not a unique dilemma in California. 
pretty much every prosperous industrial agricultural part of the world has nitrate contamination problems in groundwater. Certainly where I'm from in Delaware, Midwest, the Ogallala Aquifer, um, parts of Arizona, where we are in, this, in the uh, Central Valley, Eastern Washington, all of the very productive areas agriculturally. So if we can solve it here, there's a lot to be learned for elsewhere. Groundwater and ecosystems. Um, this is another wonderful map of the pre-development Central Valley showing tremendous large areas of wetlands and wildlands that were, again, supported largely by high groundwater tables as well as much more abundant seasonally varying surface water flows that we now evaporate off of very large fields of agriculture. Here's a map of, this, of the, in 1873, of the Central Valley showing the delta as a one large um, overflowed lands, wetlands. You can see wetlands. You can see Tulare Lake down here. Anybody? Santa Barbara people don't often make it so much into the Central Valley. How many of you have gone swimming in Tulare Lake? Anybody? You, you get very dirty because there's really no water there. It's the fields there now. Uh, so tremendous areas that, that were, were habitats for fish and habitats along the flyway, specific flyway for, for birds, migrating birds, they, they no longer exist. Or uh, in the case of uh, Sacramento Valley, that habitat for, for migration, migratory birds is now rice fields. And the, the birds can often use that. But the fish have not. And we have some research at UC Davis trying to reintroduce fish to these rice fields uh, to help them out. Make, it, make that agricultural habitat a little bit closer to their natural habitat. Uh, there's a wonderful paper uh, came out in PLOS uh, 2010 by uh, Howard and Merrifield um, on groundwater dependent ecosystems of California. And you can see some very large extents of, of wetland ecosystems and spring fed ecosystems that, um, that rely on groundwater. So those are the problems. Where are some of our successes in managing these problems? Primarily, our management of groundwater in California is local. We have a lot of local control and management of water in general, but groundwater in particular. One of the most successful practices we have to keep us from having too much overdraft in California is to price surface water to manage the groundwater. And what I mean by this is uh, the case of Yolo County and Kern County. These are surface water irrigation districts that will set the price of surface water to be a little bit less than the cost of farmers pumping groundwater. So if you're a farmer, which water source will you use first? Surface water, because it's a little cheaper. So you're not going to pump the groundwater in wet years when there's surface water available. That's good. Groundwater recovers. Not depleting it so much. In dry years, there's no surface water. So you can't buy any of it. So what do you do? You go out back, turn on the pump. That's a conjunctive use scheme that does not require any allocation of, surface, of groundwater rights, no water master, no adjudications, very low transaction costs. Just set the price of surface water right. Now, if the climate gets drier, and there's not as much surface water to make, keep the system in balance, then you're going to have some troubles. But so far, in large areas of California, that's the, one of the most effective ways we have of managing groundwater, is by how we manage the price of surface water. In Southern California, we have a lot of adjudications. Well, the red, the blue, area, blue boxes here, they're almost all Southern California. Uh, these are almost all instigated locally by lawsuits. They often have taken 10, 20, 30 years to see themselves through. Again, local courts, local judges allocating the waters. We have a lot of local recharge projects. I'll talk about them a little bit more later, um, where local agencies have brought in surface water, tried to recharge groundwater, and make it all work out. And then we have quite a few aquifer banking and storage markets, essentially, where uh, an irrigation district, which might be in the Tulare Basin, might have overdrafted groundwater. And they come to realize that that overdraft was bad, but hey, wait a minute. We can sell the empty pore space. Maybe not sell it, but rent it. So you got some extra water you want hidden underground. We don't have a lot of evaporation. 
It's right on the aqueduct on the way south. Come rent our empty space. So this is a map. Um, so the, the blue boxes are adjudicated basins where the water has been nominally divided up. The yellow dots are um, AB 3030 plans, I think, where there's some local group of locals has developed a nominal groundwater management plan. Often these plans are really nominal. They're just a way for the locals to get their ore in the water and maybe get some state money. State roles in, in groundwater management, first of all, is through the courts. They provide the overarching legal framework for the adjudicated basins. There are lots of state laws that enable local management, the AB 3030 basins and plans, things like that. Um, the surface water districts uh, are regulated by the state, and so their ability to supply that, set that price and manage that surface water so it's conjunctive with groundwater is very important. And then we have a whole bunch of state agencies uh, in terms of the State Water Resources Control Board, which works with surface water rights, groundwater and surface water quality, has a little bit of money and does some data, the GAMMA project being, being one. The State Department of Water Resources, which also collects some data, has a little bit of money, does some modeling with the, uh, and their primary, primary example I'll cite here is the C2 vSIM model recently released, sort of equivalent to the USGS model of Fontadal. Uh, this is their, their finite uh, element grid for, uh, for their Central Valley model. And then the California Department of Public Health, Department of Pesticide Regulation, Department of Food and Ag, and the counties, they all get involved in groundwater as well. So we have a cornucopia of different agencies that, that sometimes have a hard time working together um, to, to move things forward. But there's, there's a lot of capability there, a lot of data, but it's usually not under the one roof, and it's usually not synthesized very well, if at all. But they do, they do help some things. So here's, they funded, for example, the state board funded our report on the nitrate contamination, which we're very appreciative of. Changing future problems of groundwater. Well, okay, everybody, everyone talks about climate change, so we better start with that. Um, climate's gonna get warmer, we're gonna have higher sea level rise. That will have some effects on native vegetation water use, water availability, the seasonality of it, uh, and the boundary conditions on all the coastal aquifers. We're gonna have probably continued greater stress on many of the environmental objectives, not only from sea level rise, but also because of the huge other local human influences on the system. We're gonna have higher costs of surface water. So again, if the surface water is more expensive, it makes it harder for us to keep the price of surface water below the cost of pumping. What happens if you're a Central Valley farmer who's usually used surface water and because we want greater outflows to the delta, we're told, you're told, you can't use as much surface water. The farmer will say, eh, sorry, I'm just gonna go back, turn on my pump. Where does that pump water come from? Stolen surface water. So eventually it comes back to get you. And if we're gonna have long-term groundwater rights, that's how it's gonna be established. We're gonna have more high value and permanent crops. Those are, again, we're gonna make it harder to short agriculture seasonally and in the long term as, as the water system gets scarcer. We're gonna have more people, urbanization of some agriculture. The nice thing about the more people is about half of the urban growth displaces agricultural water uses. So all those suburbs that used to be tomato fields, on balance, there's a net reduction in consumptive water use but the cost of shorting a suburban development is a lot more than the cost of shorting an alfalfa field or a tomato field. So it's good and bad, but it's different. Oh, certainly more controversy. We're gonna have to integrate groundwater much more into integrated water management. We're not gonna be able to maintain the professional silos, the agency silos, we've come to enjoy uh, and work it within. We're gonna have to have much more of a portfolio approach to management, a lot more conjunctive use, aquifer storage and recovery, a lot more wastewater reuse. I had an interesting conversation earlier today 
that our wastewater reuse, the role of groundwater there is not only to st for storage in terms of balancing out the wet and dry periods, but it's also to, to treat and sort of psychically sanitize that wastewater so that we can make potable use of it later. We also have an issue of irrigation efficiency or as I sometimes like to say more provocatively, have optimal irrigation inefficiency in conservation. So imagine you go up to Yolo County and you're going to say, okay, I want you irrigators to have a very high irrigation efficiency. That means I have a lot less recharge of water during the wet years into the groundwater basin. So we have to be careful, I think, to have inefficiency there. However, on the water quality side, if I'm interested in salt balances and nitrate contamination, there I want to have higher levels of efficiency for the agricultural use because it's that excess irrigation water that's bringing extra salts into the system and it's that excess irrigation water that's driving the nitrate further down into the groundwater. So there's a, an optimization problem that we have for the inefficiency, an optimal inefficiency level of, of irrigation uh, and it differs depending on what problems we have. I, I like this slide because we have three different views of what a recharge basin looks like. So this is the Kern Water Bank. When they recharge it, they say, this is a seasonal wetland, like we would have had naturally in the Central Valley. In wet years, we would have had more wetland. Birds will be there. In other, here's another area along, I think this might be the Santa Ana River, where they've taken some ponds, some parts of the river, and they've sort of made them into recharge basins. So taking natural features and enhancing them. Here's another one. Uh, this is in Southern California someplace, but it's more like uh, uh, some, some ponds in the Arvin Edison uh, irrigation district that I've been to, uh, where the, there's nothing living in those ponds. Right? It's an industrial facility for in infiltrating groundwater. And you don't want any fish in there because it might be listed, and then you'd have to manage it for them. And so there's different philosophies between these. A lot of different ways to do groundwater reuse, conjunctive use, uh, ASR. And trying to improve the state's role. Looking at the, the probably the state's major role in a system which is always going to be locally managed is to provide authoritative information. Author, inf good information is probably the scarcest commodity we have in groundwater management. We want to have authoritative information so we can have authoritative ideas on public health alerts for nitrate contamination in rural wells, things like that. Authoritative data for the models, for the mass balances when we're doing management and allocations. And authoritative information to help us do accounting for who should, who should have the water and who shouldn't. What do you own and what do you not own? State also has roles for um, Figuring out mechanisms to compensate people when you're having to, to do water allocations in terms of quantity and quality. Who's allowed to make how much discharge? Who's allowed to take different amounts of water? The state really needs to be the ones to establish what compensation mechanisms are going to be done. It's very inefficient. A lot of transaction costs to do this locally. And by and large, the state is going to have to foster local actions, again, by, with information and mecha compensation mechanisms so that locals can better manage their systems. And in the long term, encourage the locals, together with the state, to quantify groundwater rights. This is something that's very controversial in much of the state, um, but it's a direction we all have to move into. And, and so this is a picture of what that's going to look like. Those of you that are old enough to have seen the Chinatown movies, uh, that's me after talking about the Delta ones. How well do we understand Central Valley groundwater? There's three models that have come out in the last decade or so. C2V sim by the state, CVHM recently by uh, USGS. And this is an old model, maybe uh, done by the Bureau, uh, 1997. These all really good groups. These two are more modern, building on the earlier ones. Uh, both really good groups that worked very hard for a long time. Here's the mass balances on the, on the external flows. So valley-wide, central valley-wide, they, they're in pretty close agreement. But by sub-valley, by, by basin, 
some pretty big differences. If you go over here and look at subbasins, there's quite a bit of difference in many of them, even though the total mass balance is about right. If you look at overdraft from 1921 to 1993, between these the, the two more recent models, they agree pretty close, amazingly close, valley-wide, but very, very different even by, by basin. So we understand a lot. Our understanding is getting a lot better than it was, but we still have a long way to go. So we took these new understandings and we tried to put it into our groundwater model of California, and I'll show some of the results later. All of this groundwater management has to be locally and statewide worked into the portfolios of actions. So we're, we're doing lots of different things. It's, it's, it's like the Bren School. The Bren School doesn't have just groundwater professors. I know they should only have groundwater professors, but for this audience. But it's a you generally consider it to be a much more successful school, much better successful educational ed enterprise because you have a portfolio of professors. The same thing for a successful water management system these days. You want to have a portfolio of management activities that you're, you're bringing together. So some of, many of these activities are local, many of them are statewide. They all involve groundwater. And it's really this mixing of actions, this portfolio planning that's of most interest to us. And so we've made this model, Calvin, where we've tried to integrate all of these things together, the surface water and the groundwater system, and we put it in an optimization model. Uh, the name Calvin is really a lot of fun because it has this sort of dual meaning of, of religious disciplinarian and uh, reformer to uh, a and, and mischievous five-year-old. The nice thing about these models, though, is that it forces you to develop a quantitative understanding of the system. I mean, Forget about the numbers. It helps you put the system together. We, we live in a world full of specialists and silos where we've sort of forgotten about, oh, we've got to put all these things back together again at the end. And this sort of forces you to try to do that. It's never perfect, uh, but it helps you put it together. So we did this for uh, Central Valley uh, with this model with the new understandings of California, of Central Valley groundwater. And we have about 1.2 million acre foot a year of overdraft, Central Valley wide. We've got uh, agricultural scarcities of about 400,000 acre foot a year, Delta exports of about 5.3 million acre feet a year, economic cost of scarcity about $21 million a year. So just for fun, let's say we were to end overdraft. We're going to pass a law saying you can't overdraft any basin in the, in the Central Valley. So we're going to eliminate that extra water supply what would the rest of this system do economically in terms of optimally remanaging the surface water, the groundwater, the water demands, everything together? What would it do? You've just lost 1.2 million acre foot a year. The scarcity doubles. So 400,000 acre foot a year of additional scarcity. So where's the other 800,000 acre foot of water? Most of it's coming out of the delta. So what it says is, if you, want to, if you ended overdraft, the economics of this system would drive people to try to export a lot more water from the Sacramento-San Joaquin Delta. Similarly, if you were to increase delta exports, delta outflows, so that you couldn't export as much water from the delta, it would, the model would want you to increase overdraft. So here are two environmental things that we think would be good. Ending overdraft and increasing outflows to the delta. There's a trade-off between them, and particularly in terms of the economics. And this would more than double the economic scarcity in the system. Another thing that's interesting to notice is it substantially increases the amount of artificial recharge. So I end groundwater overdraft. I increase delta exports, but because the delta exports are coming in glumps, wetter, wet, more in wet years, less in dry years, I'm now having to store that extra water in the wet years, and I use artificial recharge to do that in groundwater. So again, this all becomes, all has to work together and becomes more integrated with the operation of the groundwater and surface water systems. Um, so I'll try to move along here. Groundwater and surface water, they're, they're both water. They're connected. They work together. We shouldn't be separating them as much as we typically do. The differences are often quite compatible. The storage capacity, as we mentioned, is huge for groundwater. 
and it's already constructed. However, it's much more expensive to extract it because it requires pumping, and it doesn't re refill as fast in a flood. The nice thing about a reservoir surf on the surface is it refills real fast in a flood. Groundwater takes a little longer. Usually the floods don't last long enough for groundwater recharge in many ways. Um, regional contaminations are essentially forever. In the surface water, the residence time is a lot less. They flush out pretty quick. In the groundwater, you're sort of stuck with them for a long time. Conclusions. Groundwater complements surface water. This is something we need to think about a lot more as we move forward in California. We should manage them both together as a system. Integrated water portfolios are really the future of groundwater management, at least at the regional scale. Most integration is going to be local and regional. It's not going to be driven by the state because the state really doesn't have the money or the expertise to do this. And they don't feel the problems locally enough and in the details enough to do the management as the locals do. But the state was going to have some important roles, uh, as we mentioned, for information and the like. And regional contamination is going to be a major long-term problem that's not only a technical problem, but a philosophical and legal and political one. We're going to have to balance this out. So sort of the bottom line is water management includes groundwater. Fortunately or unfortunately, uh, there's been a lot of really interesting stuff written about water, groundwater in California. And here's sort of a, a synopsis on this. Um, ACWA had a recent report on local groundwater management. The Blomquist, this is probably the best book I've ever read on groundwater in California. Uh, it's written by a political scientist on the adjudications in Southern California. Um, Thought that all, some books we've written, uh, early study on ending overdraft, some really good things. So, bon appetit. That's it. Thank you. On your slide about uh, nitrate levels, mm -hmm. you mentioned something about the costs of source control being more expensive than the cost of contamination. But right before that, you were talking about how the contamination hasn't actually gotten to the drinking water yet. If I go back far enough. There we go. Yeah, there it is. So this is over time for the eastern Tulare Basin, so it's out in here. Wells that have nitrate above the maximum contaminant level, the drinking water standard. And this is sort of measured data. So for you know, about a quarter of the wells, it's already there. If you project, if you, in modeling land, we can continue these loadings out for a long period of time and do the calculations, and we can see that over time, we're going to have 50% or 60% or more of those wells exceeding the MCL. So th this is a problem that's going to grow. Even if we were to end the loadings today of, the, of nitrate at the surface, that water is still going to be moving down and pushing that plume on, on down. So we're, we would see this continue to grow for a long time anyway, even if we could magically end the source. And we're not about to magically end the source. Right, yeah. I guess I was just wondering, it seems like the cost for source control are probably small in, compare, in comparison to future costs of um, actually contamination. Actually not. Um, you've got 4 million acres here of very high-valued agriculture. If you were to reduce, you know, they're producing billions of dollars a year of, of profit, of revenue, if you were to reduce that by 10%, that's a lot of money. The total cost of fixing all the drinking water systems so that they could tolerate higher levels of nitrate in the source water would be about 20 to $40 million a year. So it's probably a, on that, it's a pretty big difference. So this, this, this might be one of those groundwater contamination problems that you solve by fixing the uses of the water rather than fixing the sources of the contamination. Although I, I think in, you, should really, you should look for a balance of both. You know, there are th some things we can do to maybe reduce the nitrate 
loads by maybe 20 to 30 percent, but we'd have to get to 50 to 80 percent reductions of nitrate load before we have drinking water quality water coming out of the bottom of the field. One of our big challenges going forward, you know, it will be that our traditional place where we store a lot of water is snowpack. Right. And we'll have less of that, that's for sure. Uh, and so the question is, how much would, I mean, groundwater is going to have to play a big role, but how realistic is it to think of that being as a, a main solution? I mean, of course, conservation, but groundwater management in that sense. I, I think it's tremendously valuable. Um, this is a separate set of studies than what I've shown here, but we've done some, some climate change studies with the, the Calvin model where we we uh, warm up the climate so that this, the, we have a shift in the snowpack, shift in the, in the runoff. So more, more runoff in the winter and, and less in the spring. And what, what the model wants to do there is to take a lot of our drought storage that's currently in surface water reservoirs and move that underground. If you do that, then you free up enough surface water storage because we have some fairly large reservoirs. Because you're only moving about a month's worth of flow. So actually the reservoirs, if you were to re able to remanage them that way by using groundwater for, for overdraft, for the uh, drought storage, you can make it work pretty well. It's not convenient. It's not what you'd like. You often have to re-plumb parts of the system. Um, but you can do it. It's not a, ca not a ca catastrophe. Over here. Hi. So the slide where you talked about the trade-off between the using water from the delta and overdraft in the Central Valley Basin. Right. Forgive me if I'm wrong, but that model assumes current water usage rates. How does it account for efficiency or conservation? And is there a point where there is no trade-off? So if you look at efficiency, so the, the, in the Tulare Basin, the overwhelming use of water down there is for agriculture. There's two types of efficiency to be concerned with there. One is the agronomic efficiency. Over about the last 50 years, my, my agricultural economist friends tell me that on average for the last 50 years, we've been seeing about a 1% increase in yields from crops, just from genetic breeding, plant breeding kinds of things. So you're seeing more crop per acre, more yield per acre, more yield per acre foot of water, of consumptive water use. That, that's a real efficiency. Another kind of efficiency that is often talked about is irrigation efficiency, where I put on more water than the crop evapotranspires into the atmosphere. Okay, so a 50% irrigation efficiency means I put on two acre foot for every acre foot of water that the crop evapotranspires in the atmosphere. People sometimes talk about that in terms of, oh, if I could boost the irrigation efficiency up to 90%, then I would save a lot of water. That only works if the excess water that you put on was essentially wasted. If it, if it went, ran off into the ocean or ran into a saline sink, salt and sea or, or saline aquifer, something like that. In the Central Valley, that big Central Valley, if I have an inefficiency in the irrigation, I put two acre foot on, maybe one acre foot, one and a half acre foot evapotranspires. What happens to that, that difference? That difference infiltrates into groundwater or goes back into surface water and is available for reuse downstream. So you can make a pretty good argument that irrigation efficiency isn't basin efficiency. What you want to look at in terms of efficiency for agriculture is the basin efficiency. For the Tulare Basin where most of the overdraft is, your basin efficiency is close to 100% because there's very little outflow from that basin. So improving irrigation efficiency is something that people often talk about 
particularly the less informed members of the environmental community often talk about, but it, it, it's not real water. Because you really have to look at the basin efficiency, not the farm scale efficiency. We have a really, really nice blog on this, um, on agricultural water conservation, if you want to look that up. We have, there's, a, there's a huge academic literature on the subject, actually. So I was just going to ask another question in regard to that, which is what about evaporation? Not evapotranspiration, but just like evaporation. How much of a, I guess that's maybe not a large percentage. Yeah, of so, so if you have, have poorly applied sprinkler systems, whether you have extra evaporation or you have, have uh, evaporation off of, off of the irrigation canals, that, if you can suppress that, that's saving real water. But that tends to be a relatively small amount of loss in the system as it is anyway. So um, that, that's something to be, to be careful of. Because the water that infiltrates down from that canal system into the, ba into the groundwater is often available for use elsewhere. So it's actually not a loss to the basin. perspective, the persistence of nitrate seems to be more of a carbon problem than a nitrogen problem. Would you comment on that? It's a kind of a provocative thought, I think. Well, you're out of my depth because I'm, I'm a terrible groundwater chemist. Okay. Well, I'm just thinking about denitrification in, you know, the recharge zone and how, to some degree, carbon management is a way to um, facilitate that and to manage Th the there's, persistence. There's some talk about putting in essentially carbon barriers that the groundwater has to flow through and that there are some reactions in that that will purify the water as it runs through. But we're talking about four million acres here. I mean, it, it, would, it would be fine if it was a small plume on an urban scale, but th this is, you know, you, you know, look, you go out in that landscape and, you, and further than the eye can see in all directions, that's the size of your plume. Well, thank you all very much.